Advanced Media, and welcome back to the Rutgers Rant. I am joined, as always, by James Cratch, Keith Sargent. Uh, and, fellas, I, we sort of all walked out of the stadium on Saturday feeling like we saw a funeral. And, and we covered it. We wrote about it. I did two columns on it. We did a video on it. We've talked about it ad nauseum. I wanted to start someplace else this week. And, then, and is there a scenario where Chris Ash saves his job? Is there a path? And I want to present two things for you, two scenarios. Let me know what you think. And if I'm missing anything, if I'm wrong with these two, scenario one is he goes and gets a, goes get one of these narrative changing wins, like goes into the big house and beats Michigan. I know it feels like a miracle. Does something like that and gets to five wins and and with with a couple other big 10 wins. Then you can look at it and you say, all right, we were wrong. This, the BC game didn't matter. We were wrong. There's, there, there was a way he could significantly prove the program. And number two, the other scenario is that doesn't happen, but because it's Rutgers, there is an institutional stubbornness that's there. And Pat Hobbs decides, you know what? I need a fifth year. This guy needs a fifth year. This is a hard, this is a hard job, hard place to win. And Robert Parshee, the outgoing president, he doesn't care. And there's just, and all of the people who are power brokers who have a say in this, you know, there's just not enough unity or there's different agendas and nothing happened. Those are the only two ways I think he can survive. Sarge, you've been here 20 years like I have. What am I missing? What do you see? Yeah, I'm going to be consistent to what I said you know, at the beginning of the year where we argued about Boston College being the uh, biggest game of Ash's tenure. I thought it was big. I said it before the game. Uh, but I'm still I'm going to hold true to saying that October is going to be the, the thing that defines them. Uh, I'm assuming that they're going to lose to Michigan uh, this week. and They'll be one and three going into October. But then you have Maryland at home, Indiana on the road, Minnesota homecoming, Liberty. Um, they probably need to sweep them, um, to be honest with you, you know, in order to, to get the uh, you know, bowl eligibility. Um, then you have Illinois, you know, in, in, in November, but, um, anything short of three of, of four, um, certainly is going to be bad news. But I really think that, you know, the Maryland and Indiana games right off the bat are going to be huge. Um, I'm going to, you know, stick to that. I, I, I think that, you know, if, if, you know, minimum five wins, uh, will, 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 will uh, uh, there will be a discussion and then, you know, six wins. Uh, I still think that there's a path. I think there's a very, very small percentage, but I still think that there's a path, and I think October's going to define it. Cratch, do you agree with that? I mean, you know, it, and the wake, sorry, left the door open, though. If you have to win three or four of those, then if you lose the first two, <laughs> I mean, what, what do you think? I, I think that Indiana, to me, is is not guaranteed. I made that joke when we did the win-loss, you know, part, sorry of the season about, you know, the day after the Maryland game, because if they lose to Maryland, assuming they lose to Michigan this weekend, they are one in four, and they will have lost to Maryland and BC, two very winnable games. What's going to – at that point, you're one in four. The path of six wins is gone so, unless you pull a massive upset and you run the table and the rest of that soft stretch. I just – I think at that point, you've had two cracks at the bat to win one of those kind of fork-in-the-road games at home, and you would have failed to win both of them. And at that point, I mean – you know. What's what's the worth of just continuing down this stretch? I mean, if they lose to Maryland and fall to one and four, it's over. They're not going to a bowl game. I don't see how. I, I think it's like election night where it's like it's over. Like yeah, we're calling it. Yeah, we're calling CNN it. is like CNN's <laughs> calling it. The AP's yeah. calling it. It's over. Like you're not going there. The path to save his job, in my opinion, is to go to Michigan this week and be competitive. By competitive, I mean. It's a, it's a one-score game, maybe a 10-point game at some point in the second half. Then he needs to beat Maryland, Indiana, Minnesota, Liberty, and Illinois. Sweep them, get to six wins. And then, honestly, I think he'd probably be – at that point, he'd be wise to upset Michigan State or Penn State or Ohio State somehow in November to kind of get to that seventh win. I mean, I think that would really kind of seal it. But that's the path. And I think if you lose to Maryland, the path is busted. And at that point, you know – I, I think, personally, I understand what Sarge is saying, but if they lose to Maryland, I don't know if he's guaranteed to be the coach against Indiana. <laughs> I mean, you, you said seven wins. I have a better chance of becoming a Chippendale model. <laughs> so, no, I, I, yes, exactly. I mean, they're not going to win seven games, but even at six and six, I mean, this, the, the, the vibe I get from, you know, boosters and donors and the fan base, like, even if they yeah. somehow pulled six and six out, is that really going to – 
win over all the hearts and minds that they've lost. It won't, but it has to be so. enough at a place like Rutgers. I guess I guess yes. I come back. I throw this back at you, sorry, because so what happens if they do go into Michigan like I fully expect they will and get destroyed, and it's a forty-one nothing, and you come back into Maryland and you lose that game? I mean, it's kind of the, the mood here, and that was the one thing I, that I keep on coming back to. It's like just the negativity, the the, re, the resignation. I mean, people are done with them. I, I just don't know what happens if you in that scenario if you come back with those two losses. Right, what I mean, do you really think that, that everyone's going to say, you know, Pat Hobbs is going to say, no, he's my guy. We're, we're going to Indiana. We're going to we're going to come back home for homecoming against Minnesota. I mean, do you think that's going to happen? I think we're talking about semantics here. I think, um, you know, Cratch thinks it'll be after Maryland. I think I still think it would be after Indiana. I think then, you know, you're at the midway point of the season, um, assuming that they lose Michigan, Maryland, Indiana in your scenario. Um, then they would be one and five, and then you're at the midway point. You're right before homecoming. Um, you have to remember with homecoming, not that I'm anticipating a huge crowd because uh, you know they're they're not going to have a huge crowd the rest of the way. But they had the the Hall of Fame banquet. There's going to be a lot of alums. You know that's going to be the weekend where where Pat Hodge won't be able to show his face on on, on campus. To, yeah. You know, it, 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 it just he won't be able to, 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 to get anything done or show his face. He's probably going to have to make uh, some sort of announcement or some sort of plan at that point if they're sitting at one and five. Um, again, we're talking about semantics here. Um, I, th- th- we've talked about this before. This isn't the NFL. Um, you know, they don't fire coaches midseason unless you're just trying to get a jump on, on, on the process. You're probably not trying to get a jump until late October. Pat Hobbs has been nothing but – um, committed to Chris Ash, you know, uh, uh, you know, dating back to last year when when they were one and eleven, uh, he has said time and time again that he's not going to evaluate the head coach until after the season. He may be forced to, like I said, if they're sitting at one and five, and you need to get a jump onto the uh, on, onto the coaching search. But that's it. I mean, I, I really don't see it after Maryland. I certainly don't see it after this week either. All right. <clears throat> so let's go to the BC game. And this is one thing that, uh, this is one thing that struck me about, about this game and why it was important and why I still believe it was important because it was a, a game where the talent was equal. And there aren't many games that Rutgers has had under Chris Ash where that's the case. And so I went back and I was just curious, like, you know, I went back and I tossed out all of the Ohio states and Penn states and Michigan states. I tossed out the Iowa's anytime I thought it was a mismatch. I, I scratched it out. Then I scratched out the Howards and the UMasses. Anytime it was mismatched in the other direction. And I, I, I came up with what I think were 17 games where it was either Rutgers was, you know, a slight favorite at home against like, New Mexico, or it was just an equal pro- program that I see as an equal program, something that a team that Rutgers should be beating. The record I've come up now with in those games is four and 13, which, which to me speaks to a game day coaching issue. You know, it's, it's not just talent in games like that. And this is what bothered me against Boston college. I mean, and Cratch, you, you talked, you really talked about it in, you know, I thought it was of course the brilliant, the brilliant film review. Uh, and just, you, you just saw some things in there, the conservative nature, the, you know, the uh, unwillingness, the, the not accepting your defense. I mean, it was just, it was just another example of, you know, if, if you're Rutgers, you can't be outwitted on Saturday, right? Cratch. I mean, you see, I, I mean, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I just I go back to you know when when Ash comes in for his post game press conference and he's kind of rattling off the reasons why they lost and he mentions you know the defense wore down in the fourth quarter and then I immediately go back to that fourth and ten at the end of the third quarter where the defense had just been on the field for like a thirteen play eighty two yard drive they clearly were getting the tire because the Rutgers defense tires every week. Right. You know, they don't have a lot of depth, especially on the defensive line. And it's fourth and 10 and Rutgers. I understand 10 yards is a lot to ask for in that situation, but they're moving the ball. Well, they're, they're moving the ball. Actually, I think it was the second best drive they had all game. And it just struck to me as, look, I, I get Corsac is, is an all American candidate. I get that. But if you steal an extra set of downs, your defense is off the field for a little bit longer. And it wasn't so much the time on the field as much as BC would have this up-tempo, hurry up to the line, and then they would just run like the I formation, basically. So it's a very kind of grueling style of play to defend against. Just go for it. If you, if you go for it, you're down two scores, too. If you go for it and you don't get it, and BC goes down the field and scores a touchdown, I mean, hey – it is what it is. I wouldn't fault Chris Ash for that. He took a chance because that was the only way he was going to win the game. They needed to steal a possession. They needed to steal a score on BC. And 
give that defense a little bit more of a breather. So he punts it away, and Corsac's credit, he downs it at the eight. Ball goes up. You know, two plays are basically at midfield. You know, it's just it, – Rutgers has to coach for the team it has, not the team it wishes it has. Sorry, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think it's a game plan, planning issue, uh, Steve, to be honest with you. I mean, they, they, they uh, you know, and John McNulty spends all this time scripting plays. That's what they do. They script, you know, 15, 20 plays uh, during the week for uh, them to have. They have not scored a touchdown or, you know, even a field goal on the opening possession in, in 10 straight games, dating back to the Indiana game last year. Uh, conversely, defensively, they've given a, up a touchdown all three games this season to, to start, you know, Mar- um, UMass, uh, <laughs> Iowa. And then uh, Boston College, you know, I, I pressed all three coaches this week at the press conference. I even went as far as to, to, to press Chris Ash about it because, you know, remember, they won the coin toss against Mar- uh, against UMass. They won the coin toss against Boston College, and they elected to defer, put the defense on the field first. I understand that, that, that that's a trendy thing to do in, in college football. Um, but, you know, when, when, when you're giving up a touchdown to, to start the game, you fall behind 14 nothing against UMass, you fall behind against Boston College. It sets the tone. It, yeah. You know, I, so to me, I think it's a game planning issue. You're not scoring touchdowns on your first drive, and you're and you're giving up touchdowns on your first drive. Right, right. And, I, and again, it, and it's not, and it's not just this one game. Yeah, the fact that it's three games going back to last year. I mean, the, the losing streak in Power Five teams. Yeah, it's 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 been a recurring problem now for three years. Uh, the other recurring problem for three years was cured M- miraculously. Artsikowski threw for 300 yards. I I I didn't, I didn't see that coming. Uh, you know, I'm curious what you guys think. Did a light go on? Was it just Boston College? I mean, is this something now where you you know, okay, no matter what happens, at least now we have seen a quarterback improve. That you know, there's some level of of confidence going in, even against a good defense like Michigan, where he can move the ball. I mean, Pratch, what do you think? I, I thought it was just a really well designed game plan. I know fans were down on John McNulty for the game plan, not a lot of deep shots, but I thought he put Art in position to succeed. And I think you kind of saw, we saw some glimpses last year of Art when they would run a hurry up or they would kind of go quick. Art would kind of play well, you know, catch the ball, snap the ball, catch the ball, you know, that sort of stuff. I think we saw that. I, I think it was a bounce back performance from Art, obviously. He looked a lot more comfortable than he did right. last year. Um, and I think. At this point, one and two, likely going to be one and three. I know Art's going to start at the big house. I don't know what McLean Carter's status is going forward, but at this point, what's the value in playing a graduate yeah, senior not, who's not yeah. part of your program right. for a couple of weeks? It's got to be Art from here on out. And if if Art falters or gets injured, honestly, it should be Langan and then down the line to Cole right. Snyder. All right, let's let's dive into true or false because we've got a lot of good ones this week. Uh, and and uh, here's the first one that that's really the central question: uh, true or false? Chris Ash makes it to the season finale. Cratch, go first. False. Sarge? Um. For a minute, I thought you dropped dead. Are you still there? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm going to say false, but I get back oh. to this because I, I right. haven't asked. We will. All right. <clears throat> True or false, if Ash fails, his conservative nature will be the biggest reason why. True or false, Cratch? False. Sarge? False. True or false, if Ash fails, his inability to build the defense he promised will be the biggest reason why. Cratch? Uh, f- false. Sarge? False. If Ash fails, his inability to recruit you, moron, will be the biggest reason why. True or false, Cratch? True. <laughs> Arch. True. All right, as I was making this list, I forgot that one. All right, true or false? Arch is gonna, Art is going to build on his success against Boston College and move the ball against a good Michigan defense. Cratch, true or false? True to okay. extent. Arch? True. <clears throat> Rutgers, despite having just three sacks, will find a pass rush against a mediocre Michigan offensive line. Cratch, true or false? False. False. The significant uptick in penalties is a coaching problem. Cratch, true or false? True. True. True or false? The big house is the best stadium in the Big Ten. Cratch, true or false? I'm going to defer because I have not been there Sarge, you've been to many of them. Yep. Um, false. False? Wow. That's good. All right. True or false? Michigan is going to have a coaching search too. Cratch. False. <laughs> false. All right. And true, true or false? Finally, 
the whole Michigan Rutgers satellite camp battle is a regrettable chapter in our careers that we'd all like to have back. True or false? Scratch. You weren't here for it, so I, I give you a pass. Sorry, true or false? <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> I, I'll say true. And, and uh, do you remember yeah, that, oh that when God. they were at Brandon Athletic and, oh. and and these uh, uh, people from the that secret society uh, from <laughs> Rutgers vandalized the field? Oh, I, I covered that. I I probably wrote like four stories on it because it was a pretty big deal at the time. Oh, we thought oh, that it was God. like the ash was storming in. He was challenging Jim Harbaugh. This was a great. This is a great thing. It's sort of like it's sort of like the draft day column that that Daniel Jones was the wrong pick. It's one I'm going to look back on and go I'd like to have that back. It, yeah. So that that was just a funny. It's funny to think about. It's funny to think about uh, that in hindsight. It seems like uh, the least of their problems. All right, let's go through this. You wanted to come back to sorry, you mentioned you wanted to come back to why you thought um you know that why you put an asterisk on that question about the uh, making to the season finale yeah i mean i think <laughs> again we'll, we'll go game by game i guess um i still think that he'll make it to at least uh the midway point of the season and if he was to be let go i think that uh there's a strong likelihood that uh pat Hodge will allow chris ash if he wants ah, to right coach right. at the rest of the season because uh, that's generally the way it, it, it goes. You give them that opportunity. You made the announcement anyway. You're making the change. You're, 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 you know, the coaching search has begun, but you get, you afford Chris Ash, uh, the opportunity to uh, coach out the rest of the season. If he splits Maryland, Indiana too, is this another such, is that another way? Cratch, what do you think? Beats, beats Maryland, then loses to Indiana? Is he coaching Minnesota? That's a great question. To me, to me, the reason why I said tr- false was this: is that if they lose to Maryland uh, on top of losing to Michigan and, and they're one in four, I just we go back to we, we discussed it, like it's homecoming. You know, you have four more home games yeah. left. You have homecoming left. You have you know you're not going to play a game, but you're going to have 150th anniversary week events. You know, you're going to have that game where you celebrate the 2000s, you know, and, you know, you're going to have Eric Legrand stay at the end of the year, you know, and we've talked about this before. I mean, is is the big guy everyone wants to talk about going to make an appearance? You know, it would make sense for him to be in attendance in those games. So I just think, what is the crowd going to look like? I mean, they, I said 20,000 in my story. I probably was being generous for the BC yeah, game. you were. A little less, about 18,000, 17,000 range probably. Yep, yep. Okay, so, like, what are we, like – if they're one in four after Maryland and they lose it in the end, they're one in five. What are we talking about at homecoming? Like 12, 13, 14, 15,000? Yeah. Yeah. And, and people are starting to boo. They're starting to scream. They're going to start to show their discontent. Yeah. And I just think that's not a healthy yeah. environment for any college football program, much less the 150th anniversary of the old, one of the oldest the oldest program yeah. in the country with homecoming coming up, with these big events coming up. And I just think, like, yeah, I know Sarge said, you know, like David Beatty at Kansas, he finished the year. But, like, I, I in this situation, just the way I read the fan base, I don't think that would be a healthy situation. <laughs> so I think one of two things yeah. has to happen. They've got to beat Maryland. And I think, I think, if, I think if, if he beats Maryland, I do think he probably gets most of the rest of the season, if not the whole season. He, he's got to beat Maryland, and if he doesn't beat Maryland at that point, I, don't, I just don't know if it's fair for all parties involved if you keep this going. Sarge? I think it's a dangerous thing. If I, I, I just know for a fact that Pat Hobbs is not going to make the decision based on what the fan base, uh, they've mm-hmm. given up. Uh, the only thing that's going to change it is winning. Um, at that point, I don't think he gives – I don't think he cares whether or not you know that, that he's going to you know hang um, Chris Ash and, and 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 embarrass him and 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 fire him and tell him you know you know fire him on the tarmac so to speak <laughs> um, and and you know basically say that you're not allowed to coach the rest of the season based on because the fans don't want to, uh, to see him you know that's not the way Pat Hobbs is operating nor should he operate that way and we've talked about this before I think once he makes the announcement that's all the fans really care about. I don't think, you know, they're not going to, to come out and, 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 and wear paper bags and boom, you know, once the announcement is made. All they want is the plan. All they want is some hope. So, you know, I, I don't think, uh, again, to re- reiterate, he is not making the decision based on the fans, you know, don't want to see his face. You know, they've already given up hope. The only thing that's going to change that is winning. And the only thing that's going to change that is a plan. Yeah. Uh, that's what they want to hear. But they're, he, he's not, you know, firing him on the, on, the, on the tarmac like Willie Randolph. Right. 
No, I, I wasn't. I didn't mean you know he should kowtow to the fans. I just meant I think overall, it just it becomes a really really tough situation for everyone involved. You know, and it, and it's the, you know that Jeremy Foley quote that, that that Steve had in his column the other day. I mean, I just think at some point, if you know what you're doing, you know, and, and maybe it gets done in some you know different way, as you mentioned, it's just like well, why even kind of nurse this whole thing along if if, if everyone knows where it's going right. at the end. Yeah. That's just my take. I, I, Sarge, you, you're probably dead on. But, you know, All right, let's that's dive into take. the. Uh, oh, first, I want to do something new. We usually do mean tweets here. I want to do nice tweets. I got a nice tweet this week, guys. This is so exciting. So one thing, a weird thing about Twitter is you get to interact with like people, people who have higher profile than you, like, for example, like Clay Travis, or, you know, in a bad way. So Dick, Dick Vitale, Dick EV tweeted out a photo of him and Bruce Springsteen together <laughs> and for Bruce's 70th birthday. And I, tw- and I, and I tweeted back, you know, so much Jersey. It's such a great thing. The two of them hugging these guys uh, together. And Dickie V tweeted back at me. He said, Steve, Jersey baby is special. Tell Rutgers in football and hoops, keep the scholastic superstars home. So there you go. I'm going to send that message. It's funny. There's one, the funny, <laughs> the best reply to this was uh, Iowa commas, Mike Halas, who replied to me, uh, which of those two publicly uttered the word baby more? That's a great question. Which one do you think? Between Dick Vitale and Bruce Springsteen has said the word baby more often in a public setting. (laughs) It's probably uh, a great question. Uh, By the way, just to cross promote a a podcast, Bobby Olivier's Springsteen podcast is phenomenal. It is good. It is good. It is really, really good. So while we're on the spring, we could talk about Springsteen for the next, uh, I, to close out this podcast. Higher, I'd be totally fine. Higher production quality in that podcast than ours, to say the least. Uh, all right. I'm going to say it's, I'm going to say it's Dick Vitalis and Baby Moore. Probably. I agree. All right. Project text questions. We haven't talked about it yet. Uh, a couple of things. You know, we, we, and we just, uh, I had a, after the BC game, I had a nice at the airport, just able to answer questions for an hour. Just people were furious. Uh, if you, if you haven't signed up yet, nga.com slash uh, backslash text, you can find it there. Our Rutgers Insider program. We had a lot of good questions this week. I had three of them. This is interesting. Three football basic questions about what they have to do to get Isaiah Pacheco involved. Uh, the first one was, will you, will you, will we see some RPO against Michigan, given what Army did? That's, that's a great point. Uh, is it just, is there anything the offensive line can do or schematically, or is it just size? Uh, and is there anything, uh, you know, inside in the inside running game as well? So those three, Cratch, you you know, you've obviously, you're, you're an Army fan. <laughs> what do you think about Pacheco and get him, get him, getting him going against Michigan? I do think you'll see some of that RPO concept. Um, remember, go back to last year, Rutgers really tried to use the screen game against Michigan, and they had some – they, they had moments, opportunities, but Raheem Blackshear kind of struggled. He, he muffed a couple of screens, and by the time they started to click, you know, Michigan had caught on and was basically just Art would throw a screen pass to Blackshear, and there'd yeah. be like four yeah. Wolverine helmets in his vicinity ready to engulf him. Um, actually, Raheem Blackshear told me back at Media Day in the summer that he worked a lot on his screen game this summer because he knew that's something he had to improve on. Um, because they missed opportunities, you know, Michigan and Iowa, excuse me, Wisconsin, I think were, were kind of the two biggest games, but I do think you'll try to work that. Um, I, I think they need to get the running game going. McNulty indicated as such. Um, I think Blackshear is also a key to the running game. He really hasn't had a lot of carries the last two games. I think they need, you know, he's been very active in the receiving game, but I think they've got to get him some more carries between the tackles. As for the offensive line, I mean, we've, we've been saying this for, a while now, um, since the, the preseason, it, it is what it is. You know, the the six guys that are playing with Mike Lonsdorf coming in off the bench pretty frequently, uh, those are the six guys Rutgers has. There's not really any, you know, lineup changes they can make, and the players are what they are. I think we kind of know what they are. You know, they, they played pretty decent against Iowa in the beginning. They, they didn't play very well against Boston College. Um, you know, we, we talked about slow starts earlier. First play of the game, Coming off a of bye week, your offensive line can't get knocked backwards and, and your best running back get tackled right, for a two yard right. loss. Uh, that, that can't happen. So, and that's what happened with, with BC the other day. So, I, I think they've got to get the running game going. I think it's Pacheco. I think it's just kind of hit going with it. They've got to get a push up front, get a little more black shirt. But I do think you'll see some of that. <coughs> All right, next question. 
uh, from a good fan of the podcast, fan on Twitter, Kevin Fine. We love the guy. Uh, I think we've come to the point where we resigned ourselves that the Ash era is coming to its conclusion. With that said, is there enough talent there to mature and develop so that they can be vaguely competitive in two years? And this is kind of a fascinating question, Sarge, because we, we've gone back and forth on this. We, we said the cupboard was bare when Ash got here. I was looking back on those rosters. There, there were some players who ended up playing on Sundays on the on that on that initial team. Uh, Ture, you know, I mean, they, they, it wasn't completely uh, completely gone. Do you think now the net, if if it is over for Chris Ash, that this team he is giving a better team to the next guy than Kyle Flood gave him? I do, yeah. I do. Um, I just if you go on on the recruiting uh, rankings, and you 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 touch on it. They've out recruited just based on the rankings, yeah. Boston College, um, and is, they were on par with it, Iowa. Now I get, and this is a you know you know an insider secret um, that you know these recruiting um, analysts they sometimes cook them up a little bit, you know, right. especially if they have a good relationship with with with, with a certain school. And you know, as far as that, you know, I know <laughs> it, it seems like. They, 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 there's been some cooking, you know, in, in, in the plus. Are you co- saying these things production. aren't on the up and up, Sarge? Is that what you're trying to tell me? <laughs> That's exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying that there, there's better recruiting coverage for Rutgers than there is for Boston College. Yes. Is what I'm right. saying. Um, so that that that, that tends to, to to be the case. But there is some talent uh, just based on. I always look at. And we've talked about this before, but I, I always look at. Well, who else were they offered by, rather than the recruiting ranking? You know, if if these you know guys have you know you know twelve you know fifteen offers and they're legit, then then I, I say okay, that, that that's a kid that that you know, seems to have some talent. They have enough of those guys now where you say see that. And also, it's the culture. The culture is is just better. And I know fans are, you know have a tough time defining that. But I'll, I'll say this: I mean, you know, four or five years ago, uh, there, there, you know, parents uh, would talk to me. I would routinely get it, like the concern over you know players have you know having weapons in the you know in in, in the locker room. Chris Ash had a sign in in his team room: "No weapons." I mean, that that was based on the culture from the Kyle Flood era. They have better. They just have better kids. They you know they and, and it. Presumably, they have uh, more talent. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> next question, and we've got—I mean, look—we got—we got about fifteen questions about what's going to happen here. Um, we talked about it a lot. Whether or not, it, it, in, let's flip it. Is there an advantage to keeping Chris Ash as our head coach until the season ends? Um, does Hobbs have the backing to pull the trigger mid-season? There's just so many. What? What? Here's, this is the one I'll get to, uh, Crash. Maybe you can address. Is there? Is there a tipping point when it comes to recruiting? Uh, as well, or Charles, you want to take this? this is, you, give, you get so many. You know, we talk about whether or not signing day and, and keeping a class together matters for. You know, if you fire coach midseason, will that help recruiting? I, I don't know. Get, what, what do you think about all that stuff, Sarge? I think uh, aside from recruiting, I think it helps from in the coaching search because you know coaches want to see an AD who is who who has faith and is committed to a coach and just doesn't fire you after after 3 years and that's clearly Pat Hobbs didn't do that after year 3 with Chris Ash who was still in the midst of NCA sanctions who who inherited a mess he 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 stuck with them and by not firing him midway through the season or you know if you do do at that point have a plan announce a plan give Chris Ash the 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 uh you know luxury of, of coaching out the rest of the season with his team with the players he recruited that's that's a, a sign of good faith to the next coach that you have an AD who gets it who's who's going to stay committed. I think from that standpoint, um, I, I I think it's it's good for the for the coaching search. Yeah, we got so and and Kratz, I'll let you address that as well. But we also have, I mean, we must have gotten fifty three questions on who the next coach is going to be. We don't know. <laughs> the other coach is still here. It's kind of uncomfortable. But someone wants to know if, if they if they think Butch Jones or Lane Kiffin as potential coaches. I think there's a I think there's a laundry list of reason why those two guys would not be on the list. Scratch, what do you think? I I know Butch Jones was a grad assistant at Rutgers in the early nineties. I, I just I don't get why the message boards are fascinated with him. Uh he he had some success at Central Michigan and Cincinnati, that's great. That's that's success in the Mac, that's success in like the end days of the Big East. Uh, he did win nine games at Tennessee, but at the same time, that was a real mess at Tennessee. And I just think that, you know, look at Charlie Strong, how he's having a strong career, goes to Texas, it goes off the rails. 
Um, he goes to South Florida. That's really gotten off the rails. I just think you have to be worried about, you know, sometimes these guys are just kind of scarred, you know, and, and a guy like Butch Jones is looking for any job. I mean, he's basically <laughs> an intern in Alabama now. Um, and Lane Kiffin. Um, yeah, he's like an analyst at Alabama, but like he hasn't been moved up to the staff. He's not coming here. And um, I mean, Lane Kiffin would be a hell of a lot of fun to cover, but I just I can't see stayed Rutgers right. going all in on Lane I mean, Kiffin. Yeah, something different, that's for sure. So, he, he's yeah. a whole genius, but you know, and I think the thing about Lane Kiffin too is, yeah, you could hire Lane Kiffin, but if he has success at at, at here. Uh, he's going somewhere All right. bigger. In Predictions. Heartbeat. Let's jump into what we think is going to happen this week. It's funny. I was on, so I did the Michigan podcast, the Michigan Mad podcast. I've done it every year since the Rutgers has been in the Big Ten. And, you know, I talked to this guy, Mike, super nice guy. And he's like, oh, my God, we've got some problems up here. And I just, and it's, and it's just dawned on me. It's like, it's like the guy who's got a suspension problem on his Mercedes t- telling you he's got problems, you know. Dude, the house is on fire here, dude. Like, <laughs> You're worried about a flat tire. Anyway, so predictions going to Ann Arbor, uh, 29 points, still 29 point underdog. Is that what I saw on the line? Is that right? 29? 28. All right. Is it 28 so last time I what, saw uh, it. I, I, Do you see them covering that spread? What, what, do, you, what do you got? Uh, no, no, not, not a cover. I'm going to say Michigan wins 38 to 7. Um, I just don't see Rutgers, uh, you know, they scored 16 points against Boston College and had all the opportunities in the world. Uh, this Michigan defense isn't great. Uh, it's not as good as it was last year, but it's still Michigan defense. And I think there's a lot of pressure on that offense, and they're going to be able to kind of get themselves going against that, that Rutgers defense. Uh, but I think it's probably a close game in, in the first half, maybe potentially, competitive game like it was last year to a point. But I think at, at, in the second half, Michigan – too deep, too strong, you know, too much talent. They'll just kind of roll Sarge, over. what do you got? Uh, 31-7, Michigan. Um, I think Kratz is right. I think, you know, Michigan is going to, uh, you know, control the game. And uh, I don't think he's going to get, you know, like it was three years ago. Um, but I think Jim Harbaugh is, has a lot of pressure. I think they're – they're just better. They're just better all around talent. And I think when 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 you you spend a week, you know, with the pressure that he's under, I think they're going to try to make a statement. Yeah, I am uh, in the same frame of mind as you guys, and I just come back to it. You know, I, I just I have to see them do it against a good team before I, I think they can do it against a good team, and it just hasn't happened. And you know, I don't care what happened. And I know Michigan by the Michigan standards is not a good team, but by certainly any standard that we would weigh it on, uh, Michigan's a good team. Uh, and so I'm going to, I'm going to go with like a 41 nothing kind of game again. It's just, it's, you know, it's rough, but I, it's just hard to imagine, you know, based on the, the three times we have seen, you know, Chris Ash go up against, uh, Jim Harbaugh, uh, just hard to imagine that the scenario where, uh, where this one is competitive. All right. So that's what we got our predictions. I thought we'd do final thoughts. Contract for Scott Goodell, sir. I, 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 Kratz, I think he's still underpaid. Come on. What? what? I would, I would agree. Yes. That what happened with that? It was a five-year, one point two five million dollar deal. So he had two years left on his contract. They kind of tore it up, gave him a new yeah. one with with a three-year extension. So it's now a five-year deal, um, forty thousand dollar pay raise from what he was scheduled to make this coming year. I think he was scheduled to make one hundred ninety-five grand. In 2019-20, now he's up to 235, and it'll go up 7,500 dollars each year for the rest of the remainder of the contract. Um, I expect. Uh, my understanding is that I think they're trying to hammer out, it, you know, extensions and raises for the rest of the staff as well. Um, now they got this one done. Uh, no, I definitely, you know, I think this is going to. We've said this in the past. Um, this is going to be a transition year for Rutgers wrestling. You know, especially with now the uncertainty about what they're going to do with Nick Soriano and the second semester, but once they get through this year, the way they're recruiting, the excitement that's developing in the state and in the fan base, they're going to have a chance to really take off and be a perennial top 10 program that competes for team trophies at nationals. And, you know, I think it's going to be fascinating five years from now, who has a higher t- average attendance? <laughs> men's basketball I do love, it is amazing that like the wrestling coach who was national champions recruiting at the highest level is getting paid like an, an assistant receivers coach in the football program. All right. Sorry, sorry you got anything, you got anything left, uh, left over that uh, of interest this week to talk about? 
Well, yeah, women's soccer, men's soccer, field hockey, all mm-hmm. ranked. Um, you know, it's been, you know, we, we, we've talked about the struggles of the Olympic sports, but you know, give, you know, give a lot of credit. Those, those uh, three programs are, are, you know, off on, on the right foot. And it seems like there's some, uh, positive momentum with those All three right. teams. So let's sign off there. You guys are heading to Ann Arbor without me. Very sad. I will be, you know, thinking of you uh, for a moment during a little college reunion. So uh, enjoy your trip. And we'll be back on, uh, we'll be back on Monday or Tuesday to, uh, to recap it. Thanks for listening. Uh, Steve Politi, James Cratch, Keith Sargent signing off. Bye-bye. <laughs>